And we'll begin tonight with the 18th verse of the 7th chapter of Luke. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Of course, this is speaking of John the Baptist. And uh, if we were reading this account in uh, Matthew, uh, right here after John, it would say, uh, And John, having heard in prison the words of Christ. Uh, he was in prison at this time. Now, Luke has already told us in chapter 3, you remember, that uh, uh, John the Baptist was imprisoned by King Herod, and so he's not telling us here. He figured that we could remember from chapter 3 uh, to chapter 7. But uh, uh, Matthew has it in this account, and the account that we have here from verse 19 through verse 37, or verse 18 through verse 37, or 35, that is, is almost identical in uh, Luke and in Matthew. And in this particular account, we don't find in uh, the other two Gospels, Mark and John. But you could read almost the same uh, account here. Uh, you remember we've said before that when you find these accounts or these stories in more than one Gospel, you should read them each place because usually you just won't get the whole story unless you read it in each of the accounts, because each of the writers will add some details. But that's not uh, particularly the case here. And so the situation was this. Several months previous to this, John the Baptist had been incarcerated by King Herod uh, because uh, John had uh, reproved him publicly for uh, being uh, uh, taking his brother's wife and uh, uh, the Herod didn't like this, and particularly the wife didn't like it. And so uh, they had him put in jail, and uh, they would have had him beheaded already, but uh, the people looked upon John as uh, one of their heroes. And uh, Herod was just a little leery about uh, putting him to death. And uh, you'll notice that uh, uh, Herodias, the, the wife, uh, got so angry at John till finally she cooked up a scheme whereby she was successful in getting him beheaded. Now you won't find that story in Luke. That story is in uh, in uh, Mark and it's in Matthew. And uh, uh, as is the case we found before, if you find the story in Mark and in Matthew, usually you get more details in Mark. Now that's a little unusual because Matthew is a much longer gospel than Mark. However, Mark has fewer stories or fewer accounts, but when it when Mark writes one, he puts in the details, and so you usually have a longer account or a more complete account. Not always, but usually, and that would be the case uh, in the story of uh, the uh, beheading of John the Baptist. And if you wanted to get the most detailed account, uh, you'd turn to the Gospel of Mark. And as I say, uh, it's mentioned in Luke but there's no uh, details of the story given to us here. So the situation was this, that uh, John had heard in prison through his, uh, some of his followers about all of these miracles that Christ had been doing, and uh, he couldn't quite understand why he was still in jail, because uh, the king that he had come to proclaim uh, was supposed to be just that, a king. And uh, he was, uh, he, he patiently waited there now for some months. And I expect he thought that uh, uh, his uh, life wasn't too secure. As it turned out, it, it wasn't. And he asked the question, Art thou he that should come, or that is to come? You see, that was his message. He's, uh, the Old Testament prophets had said, Someone's coming, someone's coming, someone's coming. Behold, your king cometh. And uh, uh, then, uh, in, for instance, in Micah, uh, we're told that uh, where he's going to come, he's going to come from Bethlehem. You see, uh, John the Baptist and Christ were blood relatives. And uh, John the Baptist was born six months previous to Christ. 
And you remember their, their mothers were cousins and they had attended one another at the, uh, during the pregnancy of each. And so uh, they were very close friends and they knew each other quite well. And uh, when uh, John the Baptist had been instructed by the Spirit of God how he would detect the one who was becoming Christ and that the Spirit of God would descend upon him like a dove. And he was really surprised to find out that it was Jesus, the person he'd known. That he'd, he knew who Jesus was, but he didn't know he was the Christ. And so uh, he began uh, with great uh, fervor to proclaim him. Now, the stories about John the Baptist you find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But if you want to get the words of John, you want to hear what he says, you turn to the Gospel of John. And of course, you already know that that's a different John. Uh, John the Gospel of John was written by the Apostle John, and uh, uh, which is the brother of James, the son of Zebedee. And of course, John the Baptist was the son of Zechariah, the priest, and, uh, and of Elizabeth. So uh, John had uh, been proclaiming this one that was to come. It, he uses that word quite frequently. If you'll read uh, back in his messages three times in the first chapter of John, he says, he that cometh is preferred before me. He says, I'm speaking here to tell you about somebody that's coming. And then he, uh, and again in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. So you find his words, his proclamations, his messages in the Gospel of John. And uh, the, uh, in that uh, message about the coming Christ, uh, he designated him. The first time he saw him, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Or the first time he designated him to other people. He says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now, John must have understood that Christ would be a suffering servant as well as a crowned king because, you see, the Old Testament prophets prophesied both. They, 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 for instance, Isaiah prophesied uh, that um, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way, and the Lord hath laid on him, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all, and that he be cut off from among his people. So we have his, his suffering ministry predicted by the Old Testament prophets, and also we have his ministry of glory, his kingly ministry prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. And John the Baptist was quite familiar with this because if you go back and read the uh, messages of John the Baptist in the Gospel of John, you'll find that he designated him first the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And that could only mean someone who would die for the sins. Uh, all the Old Testament pictures had looked forward to this. John the Baptist knew the Bible as they had it then, which would have been the 39 books of the Old Testament. And uh, he knew that uh, these uh, lambs were looking forward to the Lamb of God. He knew that that Passover lamb uh, that was offered up once a year was a picture of the coming Christ. And he knew that uh, when... Uh, um, Abraham said to his son Isaac, the Lord will provide himself a lamb that, uh, uh, that, that someone had to come from God and be a perfect sacrifice. And so he first proclaimed him as a lamb, the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, twice in John chapter 1. And then he also designated, designated him as the son of God. You see, John the Baptist proclaimed uh, his, uh, his, as him as God's provision for our sins, and he also proclaimed him as very God. And then in the third chapter of John, John the Baptist uh, describes him as the Christ, as the coming Messiah. So John the Baptist uh, told of the coming of uh, someone who was uh, would be God's way to himself, God's own sacrifice, the Lamb of God, he prophesied of God becoming man. And he prophesied of God's King, God's coming Christ, God's Messiah. So uh, uh, 
he had boldly proclaimed that this is the one that was to come. But you see, it's a little perplexing. Here's, here's the king, he's been proclaimed, and uh, yet here I am in jail. I'm about to get my head chopped off. Could I possibly have made a mistake? I realize there's an honest difference of opinion as to just why John sent these apostles for that reason. But the apparent, obvious reason would be, if we didn't look for any deeper ones, and I don't even know that there is a deeper one, but if the, the uh, obvious reason is that he had been wasting away in that jail. And it, it probably, uh, they didn't have jail strikes then, and you couldn't strike for better treatment in jail or something like that, and you had to take whatever you got, and it probably wasn't too good, would you think? So uh, uh, he, he was languishing away there, and that just didn't seem like a proper place for a king's proclaimer if the king was operative, wouldn't you say? If he was the king's herald and the king was operative, it just didn't seem like that that was uh, working out just like it should. And so when he heard all of these great miracles, now we've been reading about them uh, all along here, these great miracles that Christ was doing. And so when he heard about them, he says, look, you two fellows, would you go and, and take this message? And so they went. And uh, verse 20, when the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil uh, spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said to them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how the blind see and the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised uh, to the poor the gospel is preached. Now what Jesus is doing He's quoting from two passages in the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 35, he had said that when the Messiah came, he would do these things, that is, the ones about uh, causing the blind to see and the lame to walk and the lepers to be cleansed. Uh, and Jesus knew that John knew the scriptures. And he would recognize the prophet, the same prophet that said uh, that, that the king should be a man come from God, said he would do these things. And then in Isaiah chapter 61, he said that he would preach the gospel to the poor. So uh, what Christ's answer is this. You go tell John that that is being done, which the prophet said would be done when the Messiah came, and that'll answer his question. And Christ, of course, would know that that would, uh, that would satisfy John. Verse 23, he adds this. He, this is uh, uh, the little benediction he gave these messengers. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. In other words, John, you proclaimed me to be the one that God had sent. Now, I've taken the scriptures and proved to you you were right. So now you just must let things be done my way and not take offense at it, no matter what happens. That's what he's saying here. The word blessed is a, is a very uh, poignant word. It's a strong word. It means to be blissfully happy. To, to rest at complete ease. A blessed person is one that's just continuously showered with goodness. And he says, now, John, I know the circumstances don't look too good, but blessed are you, John, if you won't be offended. I am the king that you proclaimed. I can do anything I want to, and at the snap of my finger, you could be immediately released from prison but you aren't. Now, you want to be blessed? Well, don't be offended. Pretty, uh, pretty strong medicine, wasn't it? But he, Jesus knew that John could take it. Look what he says now, beginning verse 24. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people, 
concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? He says, some of you around here that know John the Baptist, you're going to be a little surprised at what, the way I talk to him. And you're wondering why I don't get him out of jail. Certainly, if I can heal the sick and raise the dead and do all of these things, I could bring about the release of a faithful messenger like that. And you're thinking to yourself, poor old John is going to perish, and he's going to languish, and he's going to faint. Well, Christ is so much as saying to anybody that might entertain that type of thought, what sort of a fellow do you think John is? Do you think he's like a reed that could be swayed with the wind? Listen, that fellow, he's an iron post. So don't worry about him. And God didn't choose a, a, a servant that could be uh, bothered by the uh, blowing of the old King Herod, that fox, Jesus called him. And uh, so uh, he says, uh, what do you think of him now? Then he goes on and says, verse 25, What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they who are gorgeously appareled and live delicately are in king's courts. Now, when you went to hear John the Baptist preach, you know, he wore those uh, old uh, garments. Uh, what did he wear, Brother Gavin? Camel's hair. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't have uh, uh, soft garments of a king's court, did he? And so it says... Uh, He's a rugged fella, so uh, uh, you ought to know that if you heard him. Verse 26, he says, But what went ye out really to see, a prophet? He says, Yes, I say unto you much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare the way before thee. For I say unto you, among those who are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. How great was John the Baptist? Well, in the, in the Gospel of John chapter 10, verse 41, there's this comment. John didn't do any miracles. You know, we, we tend to measure greatness, and so did the people those days, about how many uh, spectaculars they could perform in some way or the other, how much they could catch the eye. And uh, Jesus said of John, he didn't, well, actually, it was the comment of the people. Uh, they said, look, we regarded John, and he didn't do any miracles. And he didn't. Elijah did some very spectacular miracles. So did Elisha. So did Moses. They're all called prophets. The Apostle Paul was a miracle worker. He's a prophet. So did Peter. Peter raised somebody from the dead, didn't he? So, uh, but uh, Jesus says that John is a greater prophet than any of those. How can you know? Well, one reason Jesus said. But can you think of anybody else except Jesus himself who, whose birth, whose coming in this earth was prophesied by three spokesmen from God? Isaiah uh, said uh, that he was going to uh, be a messenger proclaiming Christ, and uh, uh, John the Baptist, when he was speaking in uh, John chapter 1, he identified himself with that prophecy of Isaiah. In the 40th chapter of Isaiah, let's look there just a moment. You hold your place in Luke. Look back in Isaiah. It's a big book right in the middle of your Bible, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. Isaiah chapter 40. Now, I know I've said this a lot of times before, 
but uh, I just have to say it again because it's it's so uh, uh, appropriate right at this point. The Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 66 chapters. Now I don't know whether it's by chance or what it is, but it'll it'll work, and you'll see as we go along here. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah have the same general message as the first 39 books in the Bible. And the last 27 chapters in Isaiah have generally the same message as the last 27 books in the Bible. And uh, the, the whole format goes right along. For instance, the ministry of John the Baptist is right at the beginning of each of the Gospels, isn't it? And the prophecy concerning John the Baptist is right in the beginning of the 40th chapter. In other words, immediately after you get through the first 39 chapters, then you have this prophecy. See, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight uh, in the desert a highway for our God. Then it goes on. This is one of those... Uh, passages that tells about who's coming. See, verse 10, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand. Now, that Lord God is Jesus. You just watch as we go along. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are strong. This tells us that he's strong and he's gentle. And uh, so, you see, uh, the uh, prophecy concerning John the Baptist is right here is, is at what would be the beginning of the New Testament of Isaiah, so to speak. Now, uh, in all the Gospels, certainly in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this it, passage is quoted. And in John chapter 1, well, it's in all of them, because in John chapter 1, John the Baptist says, this is about him. When they're asking him who he is, is he that prophet, is he the Christ, or who is he? And he says, no, uh, you want to know who I am? I'm the one that Isaiah was talking about in Isaiah 40, 40 verse 3, and he quotes this verse. And... Uh, so Isaiah prophesied his coming. And then notice what, back in Luke, notice what Jesus says in Luke 7, 27. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare the way before thee. Now this is a quote from the book of Malachi, which is the last prophet of the Old Testament. It's the third chapter of Malachi, verse 1. And you'll find this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You'll find, in each case, the writer, and in this case, in the words of Christ himself, say that Malachi was talking about John the Baptist. So you see, he was prophesied by two Old Testament prophets, the one who's considered the greatest of the writing prophets, and then the other one is spectacular because he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And then his coming was prophesied in the New Testament, in the first chapter of Luke, by an angel who came to his father. And then his father prophesied concerning his work in the latter verses of Luke chapter 1. So you see, his uh, ministry was proclaimed before he uh, embarked upon that ministry, was proclaimed four times. Now, can you name any other individual in the Bible that God did that for? Uh, did did any prophet prophesy of the ministry of the Apostle Paul? Did uh, specifically and call him by, uh, I mean, describe him so that you could tell who he was? How about Peter? You see, uh, God must have thought he was pretty important, must he? Because uh, uh, four times God tells that he's going to come and he's going to have a message and tells what that message is going to be. And that's why Christ can say here that uh, uh, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. And then he adds, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. 
But when he's talking about the greatness of John the Baptist, he was speaking in relationship to his performance of his duty here on earth. He was speaking entirely about his prophetic office. You see, a prophet is a man who speaks to men for God. That's what a prophet is. And so he was speaking of, in terms of his ministry and his earthly walk. And when he's speaking, he says that he that is least in the kingdom of heaven, what he's saying is that if you make it into God's eternal domain, I don't care how small your place is, you'll be more renowned and you'll be more uh, to be blessed than John the Baptist, and I just said he's the greatest of the prophets. So Christ was giving us a little insight into uh, what, uh, what he's got prepared for. The very, very uh, most insignificant saint in God's eternal program is going to be considered greater than was John the Baptist, the greatest of all the prophets by the words of Jesus Christ himself. Now, that ought to give us something to cheer about, hadn't it? And that's what the Lord's saying here. Verse 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. And the Pharisees and lawyers, that is the scribes, rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized by him. Uh, and the Lord... And what he's saying here is that, uh, that the religious leaders didn't recognize John's greatness. They didn't recognize his message. Now, those that you would have thought uh, were just too bad of sinners. You see, the reason somebody subjected themselves to John's baptism was to say that I want to be made ready for the coming of the Messiah. See, John's message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What John was saying is, God's king, God's Messiah, is going to offer himself to rule on this earth. That the kingdom of heaven might become the kingdom of this earth, just as, as Daniel had prophesied. But, um, of course, that didn't happen yet. It still will happen. But it was because the people that were supposed to recognize him rejected him. That is, the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus is bringing them this to their attention. But some received the baptism of John. Verse 31, And the Lord said, Whereunto shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and you've not danced. We have mourned to you, and you've not wept. Now here's the, the story here. The story is of a group of children putting on sort of a little minstrel show like to get pennies or something like that, you know, or just putting on a, uh, a little show and they're, they're playing music and uh, they're playing their parts and you're supposed to clap when you're supposed to clap and you're supposed to uh, be sad when you're supposed to be sad. You're supposed to react, aren't you? Uh, you, uh, uh, you appreciate it. And he says, well, you're like an audience. Here, here are the little children just beating their hearts out, playing their parts with all they know how and you sit there stone-faced. You don't smile when you're supposed to smile. Uh, you don't uh, look merry when you're supposed to look merry. You don't uh, weep when, when the, the scene is sad. You just don't do anything. And he says, you're that same way about the message of John the Baptist and about my message. He says, we're telling you the truth, and, and we're telling you what to do, and you don't react to it. He said, that's, that's, uh, that's the picture I'm making here. And he gives the, the reason why he makes that pronouncement. He says, uh, verse 33, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say he hath a devil or a demon. And the Son of Man, that's uh, Christ's favorite name for himself, is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. He says, it wouldn't make any difference if I acted like John the Baptist and John the Baptist act like me, you'd still find fault. Uh, there's no way in the world. It's sort of like 
the, the Republicans and the Democrats. There's no way in the world for a Democratic president to do something so that the Republicans will say that's great or vice versa, is it? They just won't do it because they're on the op opposite side of the fence. So he says, it doesn't make a bit of difference. Whichever side I take, you'll take the opposite side. And uh, I suppose our last several presidents uh, thought that's the way Congress op operated. Whatever, <laughs> didn't make any difference what side they take because <laughs> the other side would go against them. And so that's what he's saying. He says, uh, John the Baptist came as a very austere person. He stayed to himself. He didn't socialize at all. And uh, you said he had a demon. And then I come making friends with people, and you call me a gluttonous person. Says, so there's no way we could please you. You just like that audience watching those children. There's no way in the world they can get you to react. And then in verse 35, wisdom is justified of all her children. What he's saying here is that you, it's all, you can tell ultimately what was wise and what wasn't. Because if the action taken was wise, if the publicans and the sinners uh, who uh, received us were wise, time will tell. The, the wisdom's children is, is, the, is the end result. What does wisdom produce? What's it going to produce? And if what John was saying and what Christ was saying was wisdom, then it would vindicate itself. You don't need to vindicate wisdom. Wisdom will eventually vindicate itself. This is particularly interesting if we realize that Jesus Christ is wisdom personified. One of the most interesting uh, little activities in the Bible is to read Proverbs chapter 8. It's all about wisdom. And in the first, about the first three verses, wisdom is spoken of as she. And then wisdom begins to speak in the first person. And the rest of the chapter is in the first person, I, I. And so wisdom is speaking. Then I've been for, uh, around forever, and I've done this, and I've done that. Well, it's interesting. Everywhere you see the first person singular, you could put Christ in the chapter read beautifully. It's wisdom speaking. I'm this way, and I do this, and I so forth, and I... I've done this and so forth. And you could put Christ instead of I. And he could speak for wisdom and it would fit every place. Isn't that interesting? And uh, of course we shouldn't be surprised for that about that because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 we're told that Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom. Some other things too, but wisdom. And in uh, Colossians, is it 3 2 or 2 3? In him, uh, it's 2 3, isn't it? In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ Jesus are hidden. They're not on the surface to just the casual eye, but in Christ Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I believe that's uh, Colossians 2 3. Somebody will look it up and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh -huh. Colossians 2 3. Now, we're through with John the Baptist for a while, unless somebody wants to uh, say something about him. Baptist are not considered That's a very good question. And you have to understand the, the term the kingdom of God. 
in the Bible, the kingdom of God represents all of that, uh, that whole broad scrape, uh, scope, which has uh, joined itself under his program. And you'd say, well, wouldn't that include uh, John the Baptist? And the answer would be yes. And there's certainly a sense in which John the Baptist always was a part of the kingdom of God. And there's where the confusion might come in. Because he was within the overall scope of what God was controlling, wasn't he? When he was in his ministry. So you would say, how could the least in the kingdom of God be greater than him when he was part of it? It doesn't quite fit. Well, you see... What Christ is looking at is when the kingdom shall be delivered up to the Father and God shall be all in all. And what he's saying is, is when the kingdom of God is in complete manifestation everywhere or comes into its complete uh, uh, fruition, manifestation at that time. So sometimes when you're speaking of the kingdom of God, what the scripture is letting your thoughts go to is that time when God is all in all and every knee bows and every creature acknowledges. Now you see this build up in a crescendo throughout the book of Revelation as one group of creatures after another uh, say, yes, he's God. See, not all of God's creation is acknowledging that now. There is part of the operation outside of the scope of following his direction. And so what we're being told here, and it's, it's all right, the kingdom of God is used in both of those senses. Part in, it's used sometimes, all that he is currently doing, but it, anytime you see the term, you want your mind to go forward to that time when everything will be acquiescing to his complete control. And so, what he's really saying is, when the kingdom of God is in full manifestation, at that time, the very least human being in that will be greater than John the Baptist is now in the ways that I've recognized him. Now, I don't know if that brings it out or not. But I'm sure that that's what it means. Anybody got a thought on it? Or maybe I better not say I'm sure because then you'll have to say, well, he's wrong in order to be careful with me. Uh, I'll say this. It's the type of thing in the Bible that does bother us a little bit, but if we approach it this way, Jesus said it. It has a perfect answer, and I believe the Lord would let me know, and I believe you would clear it up for me. It's one of those things that the Spirit of God will be glad to uh, clear up with us as we uh, get into the Scriptures, and uh, He'll teach us those things, and it's not always possible for a human instrument to clear it up uh, to our complete satisfaction. But uh, uh, the Lord will. John the Bible doesn't tell us how intimately they knew each other. We know that their, their mothers were very close. And so we just assume that they were known. Now, this bothers some people because in the first chapter of John, uh, John, John the Baptist says, I knew him not. What he means is I didn't know him as the Messiah. And uh, we can only assume because family relationships were close and there was nothing to cause an estrangement to come about there. So certainly they knew one of the other uh, quite intimately, whether they had a lot of association or not. Well, let's say, fully manifest. Because since he never sinned as a child or at any time, and since we find some manifestation of his godhood in the episode when he was a 12-year-old, well then, 
we couldn't say that there was no manifestation uh, until uh, age 30. But he he didn't come into his ministry. He didn't. He his hour was not yet come, so to speak, uh, to uh, uh, to manifest himself openly and publicly until he was 30 years of age. Now, I almost hesitate to start on this passage. It begins with verse 36 because I don't believe I can possibly finish it in the allotted time. But uh, it's, uh, it's very intriguing. And uh, I don't know anything to do but at least read a considerable part of it to start with, and then we'll go from there. Luke chapter 7, verse 36, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to, uh, at meat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that uh, Jesus was at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, who had bidden him, saw it, he spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answering, now the man didn't, you see, he said, he said this within himself, but Jesus knew his thoughts. Jesus answering, he said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. Uh, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said, To him, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, He turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and you gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is given, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they were that at meet with them, began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgives sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Now notice when the Lord was speaking to Simon, that he pointed to her works. But when he told her what saved her, he made it clear that it was faith that saved her not works. And he made it clear to all that heard that she was saved by, um, by faith and not by works. Now, you know, in our natural minds, we would kind of sympathize with this fellow. Here he was in a nice home, and he'd invited Christ to be his guest. And here came this interloper, of very ill repute, no doubt. And there were the nice folks we're sitting, she comes up and uh, she starts uh, crying over his feet and anointing them and weeping them and, and wiping them with her hair and such as that. And he doesn't do anything to try to straighten the situation out, you know. He just uh, lets her go on. And this must have been very distracting. And then uh, I'm sure in our natural minds we have a a bit of sympathy for this host being in the situation. And uh, we can't quite understand why somebody would want uh, somebody around crying over their feet anyway. 
And uh, so uh, it's a little difficult, maybe, for us to get into tune to just uh, just what the the true situation here is. Now we can get the moral to the story uh, fairly easily. Uh, we can see that what Jesus is telling this Pharisee is, you think you're so good you don't need a savior, and you think you're so good that you don't need to weep over your sins, and uh, you think you may have a few faults, but they're so few compared with somebody else that it wouldn't strain God very much to forgive you. Whereas this one here, she's got much to forgive, especially in your eyes. And uh, uh, the reason she is displaying her love in a way that you wouldn't think of doing or even come close to is because she's so appreciative, because she has uh, received so much. And uh, really, uh, to be frank about it, you don't think that I have too much for you anyway. So this is the, you can, you can get this part. But that's uh, uh, fairly nearly on the surface. And uh, we don't want to just skip over this uh, before we see what might be deeper. In each of the four gospels, there is an account of an anointing on the part of a woman, uh, in a public anointing in this manner of the Lord Jesus Christ, in each of the four Gospels. Now, in many commentaries, the thought is that they're all the same with somewhat different details given. And I have two very well uh, thought of Bible dictionaries. I don't mind uh, telling you. Uh, I think they're as good as you can get. One is Unger's and one is Zondervan's. And uh, in both of those, they take the position that there were a total of two anointings uh, among the four accounts. Now, after carefully re reading and considering it, I believe that there are three I believe the Bible teaches of three different instances, and I'll uh, first describe them roughly this way. This one that we have in Luke is only in Luke, and it's in the home of a person known as Simon the Pharisee. And uh, in this case, this happened fairly early, relatively early in the ministry of Christ. It's very obvious if you read through the narrative, that this happened earlier in the ministry. And this woman here is said to be a sinner. And, and the inference is that uh, uh, she has lived a life of deep immorality. <laughs> and uh, she uh, is said not only to anoint his feet, but to have washed his feet with her tears. Now, this is not said by uh, any of the other accounts, the other anointings. Now, the, uh, the next account is said to have happened just six days before the crucifixion of Christ, six days before the last Passover. And that account is in the book of John. And it's in the 12th chapter of John. And the woman doing the anointing there is said to be Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And it's said to be in the little town of Bethany. Uh, that was the place where Jesus usually went in the evenings when he was staying around Jerusalem. It was about two miles out of the eastern gate of Jerusalem on the south slope of the Mount of Olives. And uh, as you know, these were very dear friends. And this was sometime after uh, Mary's brother Lazarus had been raised from the dead by, uh, by the Lord. And this anointing there was, um, as far as we can see, there was no weeping, uh, but the anointing was a very precious ointment, and she anointed his feet. 
and we had an altercation there where Judas uh, uh, took exception to it and said that the ointment was very valuable and had been should have been sold so that uh, uh, it could have been given to the poor. And Jesus said that she was anointing him for his burial. In other words, she, she was foreseeing his burial. Now, that's the second account. The third account is given in both Matthew and Mark. And uh, in that account, the woman is not named, and it's said to be in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper. You see, you have a Simon in, in both places. But there, if you read it real carefully, it says that that anointing happened just two days before his crucifixion. Now, I don't see how one could happen six days before and one two days before and be the same anointing. And there the anointing was not of his feet, but is of his head. Now, we'll look at them just a moment because the others, are, the accounts are not nearly as long as these, and we don't have to look at, uh, at Mark and Matthew because there the details are very nearly the same. But uh, I believe we have... Uh, three entirely separate anointings here. Uh, three different occasions. And uh, it, Luke gives us one of the three, John gives us one of the three, and then Mark and Matthew give us the third one, both reporting that. So now let's leave the book of Luke for a moment, and let's... Uh, Let's look at John chapter 12. By the way, the very next story in the seventh chapter of Luke after the one we considered mentions Mary Magdalene and uh, many people have been saying in many circles that this woman that anointed the feet of Jesus was Mary Magdalene. But there's nothing in the Bible whatsoever except that they, the stories happen to be next to each other in the Gospel of Luke. And that's just somebody's surmise. And there's no foundation to it at all. Mary Magdalene is said to have had seven demons cast out of her. But she's never said to have been uh, a woman known for immorality and so forth. So. Uh, the next time you hear uh, Mary Magdalene uh, discussed in such a manner, you may just be uh, uh, passing on hearsay because there's nothing in the Bible that would uh, lead to that conclusion. That's just a uh, aside. Now, John chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover. Now, all we'd have to do is to read on here and we find that this is the Passover day on which Christ died. So this was six days before his death. And see, the Bible is so definite about setting the time here. And it's not possible that this other anointing that we've read about in Luke could have been the same time because uh, many, many, many events happened after that. And it, it couldn't be the same. There's no way in the world for it to be the same account. And, and you'll see the circumstances are different. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, uh, where Lazarus was, who had uh, been dead, whom he raised from the dead, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with them. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now that concludes the part about the ointment, except Judas' uh, problem there and in the Lord saying that she was doing that for his burying, burying. But notice she wiped his feet. Now, I just before we go to the next account, I just want you to look at one thing. Back in the 11th chapter of John, chapter verse 32, John 11, verse 32, this episode happened about six months previously. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Now notice, she calls him Lord, and she's falling down at his feet. In chapter 12, she's anointing his feet. Okay, now 
uh, to um, let's look at the account. Well, I guess it's uh, closest to Mark, so let's go to Mark chapter 14. And we'll see, and you could read this account also in, um, in Matthew 26. Now notice in Mark chapter 14, verse 1, after two days was the feast of the Passover. Now that, that's really clear, isn't it? And if you read on here, you'd have to, you'd see by the chain of events that Christ was crucified two days later, on the second day after this event happened. The other said six days, and this said two days. And after two, two days were the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. And they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar. But they did kill him on the feast day anyway. Verse 3, And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. See, this is where you get your two Simons mixed up. As he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, same stuff, probably the other woman had. Very precious. And she broke the box and poured the ointment on his head. And there were some of them that had indignation. Well, the comment's about the same here, but there's some differences. So you see, the one in John was six days before his crucifixion. The one in Mark is two days before his uh, resurrection, uh, I mean his crucifixion. Uh, the one in John was the anointing of his feet. The one in Mark, the anointing of his head. And I'm sure if you'd read these closely, you'd find that these two anointings were the same person, that Mary was doing the anointing in both of these times, not the other time. This, these two more anointings here were both that Simon the leper was the father of Mary and probably not living at this particular time, but it was at his house is just by way of identification. Now, I want us to go back to Luke chapter 12. 10, chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, 38. And it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, this would be the same Bethany, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now, notice there's a progression here. This was early in the ministry of Christ. Early in the ministry, Mary was sitting at his feet hearing his word. Later in the ministry, she fell at his feet, and then she was anointing his feet. Well, why all of this attention to the feet, you might say? Well, this is really going to test me, but uh, uh, let's look first back in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3.15, and I, that's God, will put enmity between thee, that's Satan, and the woman, and between thy side, the seed, that's the, the followers of Satan, and between her seed. That's the descendant of the women. The Bible will, will let you know that Eve's seed is Christ. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, most of you will recognize this verse as the first clear prophecy of the crucifixion of Christ and of the uh, conflict of the ages between Satan and Christ. Notice there's a figure of speech here, a poetic phrase. It says, Satan will bruise the heel of Christ, and Christ will bruise the head of Satan. Now, bruising the heel means that Satan will be the power that causes his walk to cease on this earth. Now, uh, the Old Testament prophets had much to say about the walk on earth of the coming Messiah when he came. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 53, which would be the gospel part of, of, Matthew, of, of Isaiah. Isaiah says that when he comes, he shall be cut off from among the living without a progeny. Who shall declare his generation or his progeny? Because he'll be cut off 
That phrase means he won't be permitted to live any longer on the earth. His heel will be bruised. That's what the figure of speech means. He won't be able to walk on this earth any longer. Now, the heel getting bruised doesn't mean he's done in forever. The head getting bruised does. That was That's Satan that gets his head bruised. It's Christ who gets his heel bruised. Now, also, this same phraseology is in Daniel's prophecy, where he says that the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. He shall be cut off from the land of the living. Now, you put this together with verses like, I mean, uh, passages like you have in Isaiah chapter 50, where it says, beautiful are the feet. Uh, be beautiful upon the mountains of the Lord are the feet of those who bring good news, publish good tidings. Brother Gelney could quote that right. I just kind of uh, messed it up a little bit. But anyway, beautiful are the feet. Now, you see, when this sinful woman that we saw in Luke 7, when she was anointing the feet of Jesus, she was acknowledging the truth that you and I must acknowledge if we're ever going to get to heaven, and that is, it's only by his walk on this earth that we are saved, and not by ours. God has a perfect requirement. He says, be ye perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. He can accept no lesser standard. He cannot accept, uh, if I'm perfect every day but make one little slip, I, I, I cannot enter heaven. Heaven is a, a place only for those who have uh, lived a perfect life according to God's holiness. Now, I cannot do that. I've never been able to do it. I won't be able to do it as long as I live on this earth. And so what God provided for me in the life of Christ was his perfect walk on this earth. He imputed this to me. That's what all the Old Testament uh, business is. You know, when Aaron had to put blood on his big toe, that was a picture that Christ would walk a perfect life. And in the sacrificial animals, when they would wash their legs and feet, his walk was perfect. It was clean. All this looked forward to that. He never did a single thing wrong. He could always say, I do always those things which please the Father. And these women were acknowledging that except that those feet had deigned to walk upon this earth, that they would have been forever lost. And that's what brought on such devotion to the feet. Now, this woman, all she knew was that her sins were forgiven, and she knew that it was that walk upon which it was based. You say, well, I thought it was the death of Christ. Look, the life of Christ is your ticket to heaven. The death of Christ is your uh, release from hell. It wouldn't be any good to have a ticket to heaven if you're still heading for hell, would it? His death bailed you out of hell, redeemed you from hell. But his life furnished your ticket to heaven. Perfection is required to enter into heaven's gate. And it will only be through the righteousness of Christ which God is pleased to impute to you, placed to your account because you did what this woman did. She says, I'm a sinner, and except these feet that I'm anointing walked on this earth, I would never be able to attain unto the righteousness required by God. But he walked the, that righteousness for me. These feet produced that righteousness that God requires. And that's what brought about the devotion. And when Mary anointed his feet there just before he died, she had already sat at his feet. And she knew from his own instructions. And she'd already prostrated her feet, herself before his feet and acknowledged his lordship. And what she was wanting to do 
she was wanting to show forth just before his walk was cut off, before his heel was bruised, before he was cut off from the land of the living, she wanted to proclaim by putting the most costly possible ointment she could find anywhere and massaging those feet with that ointment to show uh, what those feet did for her. This was her way of saying it. The rest of them didn't understand that. A slightly different reason. See, this woman, this first woman, she was just overwhelmed with joy uh, and release. Mary, just understanding, showing her understanding. Now later she anointed his head to show that she already knew that he would be resurrected. She anointed him as king. You see, the kings were anointed on the head. And that's why Christ said to this Simon the leper, you didn't recognize me as king. You didn't anoint my head. You, you invited me to eat here with you, but you don't think I'm the king. But Mary did. You see, it was proper that she would first anoint his feet and you anoint the feet of Christ with fragrant ointment. When you proclaim publicly your debt to him for what he did on this earth, you anoint his feet, and there's a fragrance. You know, let's suppose that Christ had got up from that anointing where she'd anointed his feet, and he walked through the next room, and there were people in there. The fragrance on his feet would fill that room, wouldn't it? But let's suppose this. Let's suppose he stayed in this room and the one who had anointed him walked in there. The same fragrance would have filled the room, wouldn't it? So you see, the same anointing fragrance fills the room when you have done the anointing and you walk among on this world. The fragrance is there when you anoint the feet of Jesus. And you do that when you acknowledge publicly your great debt for what he did in his walk on this earth for you. And then his head's anointed when you proclaim him as the coming king. And that's what Mary was doing. So you see, there is more here and shows on the surface. And I'm sure we haven't even gone very deep yet. But when you see these things over and over again, when you see these sequences, like Mary, sitting at his feet, falling at his feet, anointing his feet, you can be sure, always in the Bible, that's a progression, especially when you can see it was a time progression in her own life. And when you see these little distinctions, anointing the feet, anointing the head, there's a reason for the difference. And God is teaching a fuller lesson. And it's just a misunderstanding to say it's all one thing, uh, but in one place, they, she, see, you read the comment about it, and it's this. Mary anointed his head and his feet. But one of the, the writers I happened to pay more attention to the feet and one to the head. So one's told about the head and one's told about the feet. No, that, see, that doesn't fit uh, the situation. It was proper that she would anoint his feet six days before. And then it was proper that she said, I know he's going to die. I'm anointing him for his burying. Jesus said that, but she said, I want everybody to know that I know he's the king and he's going to rule and I'm going to anoint him as king. And so you see, after we anoint his feet, we need to anoint his head too. We need to let the world know that we know there's a king and we need to anoint him when he's not yet manifested to the world like Mary did. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you again for all that there is in this book. And we pray that 
we'd spend the proper amount of time to find out what you're saying in these uh, messages. In Jesus' name, amen.